So what I want to do in this video is uh, cover the crisis of the late uh, medieval period, uh, the crisis of feudalism, and the transition into uh, what is often called the Renaissance. Uh, but uh, I want to show how that crisis, uh, these crisis factors, were really just uh, laying the seeds of capitalism. And, and so that uh, this whole section does a lot to explain how, uh, how we got from feudalism to capitalism. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and this is very important uh, for Marx because his big issue uh, is to use feudalism as a historical example and draw comparisons between feudalism and capitalism and see that there's a lot of structural similarities and especially in terms of the explo exploitation of labor, um, there's some, some key similarities. All right. So uh, I just want to remind us about the caliphate. So here's the Byzantine Empire, uh, which they called the Roman Empire. Okay, this is the late Roman Empire, uh, and it begins to dwindle away. Of course, the western part is lost uh, by 476. So like on the timeline here, uh, yeah, the, the timeline's a little off here. Okay, so, you know, the empires, you know, cut off here in, in the Balkans um, by this, by the sixth century. Uh, but we do see that uh, Northern Africa and, and uh, what later becomes Granada um, in Spain are, 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 are truly under control. And this, this Eastern part looks accurate. Uh, but then we have the Sassanid Empire, which is a uh, sort of Persian um, rejuvenation um, of the, per you know, a, a rejuvenation uh, of the Persian Empire. Okay. And then, uh, and one thing we should notice again is that the Arabian Desert, so this is where Muhammad lived is shown as you know not under control uh, of the Sassanid empire uh, and then uh, in inspired by muhammad in the quran and islam uh, you know we have this explosion of the caliphate in a very short amount of time within decades uh, you know and notice that spain modern day spain is entirely overrun by Muslims and um, and and uh, a lot of the the people in the Islamic Empire that were entering into uh, Al Andalus as they called it were um, what would later be called Moors by European um, and they're Northern Africans. Um, uh, from Morocco, you know, and here uh, Carthage used to be here, modern day Libya, um, these Northern African people, uh, darker skinned people, uh, we should say, and, um, and so they're, they're coming in uh, across the Strait of Gibraltar and making incursions even all the way into uh, Francia. So this is you know, um, uh, something that creates a threat, an outside threat for Europeans and kind of helps them to unify. Um, but also then we need to think about the way in which there's cultural transmission taking place, especially through Al-Andalus into uh, European centers of learning, especially in Italy and France or Francia. And, um, and we want to follow along the kind of intellectual modifications that, that take place here. And one big thing is that we have the work of al Khwarezmi, um, 
uh, Alcarizmi, I should say. I always have trouble pronouncing that. Um, and he worked at the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. That's the you know original university. And he wrote the compendious book on calculation by the completion of balancing. Okay, um, completion here, the word completion is algebra or algebra in Latin. <laughs> so the Latinized version of algebra is algebra. He wrote the book on algebra and he showed, you know, this is like a scientific uh, explanation of the way that algebra works and, uh, and a very complete um, sort of explanation. What the scholars at the House of Wisdom and, and other uh, Muslim scholars uh, discovered in India, because of course the, the caliphate stretched all the way out, uh, India is just beyond here. Uh, you know, so we're getting into uh, parts of modern day Afghanistan and, uh, and then just across uh, the Indus River is India, and so there was a lot of cultural exchange there, and a lot of Islamic scholars venturing out and exploring, and and lots of Indians coming into the empire. Um, and what the scholars discovered is that the Indians had this unique numeral system. They had a unique way of writing numbers, and this numeral system is the one that we use, right? So, uh, I don't know if they have, you know, it's using these symbols. And, and there were lots of different versions, okay, in India, but it's the same basic system. There's 10 symbols and then you arrange those like you write the the number one, 127, you write a one, a two, and a seven. And that makes 127, it has place values and all that. Uh, that comes from India um, originating maybe in 300 AD, something like that, uh, well before the Caliphate. And, um, and so the, the the Arabic philosophers took those numbers and then uh, Al Khwarizmi he you know wrote the book on it uh, that was then translated into Latin and made its way into Europe um, later on uh, and uh, I've mentioned Averroes before so remember that he's in Cordoba and Al Andalus and he's influencing philosophy and i'll have more to say about that later um and uh, now the way that algebra and arabic numerals which are indian numerals so the arabic numerals uh you know that we use are and they are now the num numbers that we use are very similar to the uh, they don't have it i mean in the medieval period and you can see it even today in some arabic uh, typography um, the numbers were somewhat different from what we use and I, i'll see they don't have a good graphic here of it uh, Yeah, so here, and maybe it's good. So, you know, about this time, this is like sort of the way that things had been standardized. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And, um, and, And so, you know, and then eventually it morphs into something that, okay, this looks a lot like our numbers. Okay, that's looking, that's looking more normal. Um, but it's the same system, just different symbols, you know. 
the the symbols are arbitrary you know um it's just the way that you you organize them that makes the meaning and uh for a better understanding of what I just said there philosophically, uh, take my philosophy 106 class, logic, intro to logic, and uh, I unfold that quite a bit. Um, okay, so, so those are the, the Indian Arabic numeral system, and normally we call these Arabic numerals in, in the English, the English speaking world now. And these were really introduced into Europe, uh, not by al Khwarizmi's work, uh, but by the work of a guy named Fibonacci. And you may have heard of Fibonacci uh, before. There's a Fibonacci sequence. Um, he's the one that came up with that. And he wrote a book called the Liber Abaki, um, and that's the book on calculation. And basically, he shows how to use Arabic numerals instead of the numbers that people were used to using, which were Roman numerals, which don't have place value. And, you know, so you get you get uh, structures like this. Um, so you have 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Notice that they're all different lengths, so you don't get the columns, nice neat columns like we're used to working with when we're adding or multiplying, all the sort of uh, calculation techniques that you were taught in elementary school. Um, it, those techniques don't work with Roman numerals. But once you have the Arabic numerals, it all works. And Fibonacci introduces Europeans to this uh, in this book. And this is 1202. So this is when this is the high uh, medieval feudal order. And when universities are starting to pop up all over the place. And Fibonacci writes this little book and, and uh, shows this totally new way of calculating things. This is quite revolutionary. Um, but most interesting, not to scholars, but to bankers, because it shows you how to calculate interest and to do like what we call bookkeeping, right? So, um, so if you're a banker, uh, Fibonacci shows you how to keep your books and to calculate interest and to do projections and really work out what sort of interest rate you want to charge and all that kind of stuff. Now, um, this is revolutionary and, and uh, tr problematic for feudalism because feudalism being rooted in Roman Catholicism, uh, usury, charging interest, was uh, forbidden, was illegal. And so you could be severely punished for um, for being a banker as problematic. Okay, so, and so uh, now charging of interest, uh, that's what usury means, is charging interest. So when anybody charges interest on a loan, which for many people in the United States, it's hard to think, how would you loan money without charging interest? That just doesn't compute, right? Why would you loan money if you're not gonna make more money out of it? So, but, um, but uh, but charging interest was forbidden, um, and and it's, it goes back to the the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, uh, which is the Old Testament uh, of the Christian Bible. And in Exodus twenty two twenty five, it says, uh, "If you lend money to one of my people among you who is needy, do not treat it like a business deal. Charge no interest." Okay, charge no interest. Very clear. Um, and so that creates a problem because Fibonacci's book was popular because people were charging interest. Um, so there were bankers. <laughs> um, and at the Council of Nicaea, uh, so remember Council of Nicaea was when Constantine um, sort of strong-armed the patriarchs into 
you know, getting rid of Arianism and making a proper imperial religion out of Christianity. Um, back in 325, in that one of the one of the the doctrines that they laid down was that the clergy could not operate as bankers. So, so he didn't want clergy members being bankers. Okay. Uh, coming out of this Exodus 22, 25 um, pronouncement. And then the third council of uh, the Lateran, so the, the Lateran palace that I discussed before, I believe, um, where the Pope resided, there's a council, the third council that was there. Um, one of the doctrines they decided upon was the prohibition of usury among the laity, so non-clergy members who were Christians. Okay, um, and that's 1179. So that's just a couple of decades before Fibonacci is writing this book. Uh, so this is becoming an issue. So the, they don't want Christians being bankers and charging interest. But Jews were allowed to practice usury. So, you know, this is one of those roots of the the uh, you know the mythology and demonization of Jews in Europe uh, as being greedy uh, you know is because during this period they were uh, essentially the only people that were legally allowed to be bankers there were other people doing it but but they were legally allowed to do it and um, now you would think, but wait, Jews, they, that's their Bible, the, the Tanakh, Exodus, that's, that's their book. Why are they charging interest? Well, in Deuteron Deuteronomy, it, it, there's an elaboration here on, on the prohibition. You may charge a foreigner interest, a non-Jew, but not a fellow Israelite, so that the Lord your God may bless you in everything you put your hand to in the land you are entering to possess. Okay, so this is when... Moses is across the Jordan and they're coming into the promised land. Um, and he says, okay, when we get to the promised land, you can charge interest to the foreigners living among you, but not to, not to your fellow Jews, fellow Israelites. This is really before they called themselves Jews. Um, but, uh, and so for Jews, it was not a problem because of that Deuteronomy passage. Um, and, and there was a lot of prejudice, prejudice against Jews. They were considered, you know, infidels that were going to hell, according to Roman Catholic uh, doctrine. Um, so, you know, not too many people were excited about hiring Jews for lots of jobs, but one job that was available to them and totally above board and nobody was going to give them a hard time about was, was banking. Okay. Um, then the fourth council of the Lateran Palace, uh, then, you know, modified things, and this is in 1215, just a decade after Libera uh, uh, Fibonacci's uh, book, and it prohibited Jews from charging exorbitant interest rates. So, um, and that would, you know, be decided by local custom what was exorbitant, but there was at least the legal. Um, legal leverage for a local magistrate or judge uh, to curb the the interest rates that were being charged uh, by the Jewish bankers okay so so there's that and and so usually when people use the word usury now in like modern day our, our contemporary United States they mean charging of exorbitant interest rates. Okay, so of course, credit cards are usurious when they're charging people 20% interest, that's, that's exorbitant. Um, okay. Uh, now, this is an issue because the rising importance of money 
you can see that money is becoming a more central feature of the economy. If there's all this concern about banking and charging interest, that means people are holding wealth in money form and bankers are charging interest in money form. The whole uh, land-based economy of feudalism of the earlier centuries is, is beginning to break down. Everything's not based on, on feudal land tenure. Things are much becoming much more based on money. Feudalism still exists, uh, but there's a lot of money circulating. Okay. Uh, and, and that's one feature of feudalism is with the downfall of the Roman Empire, the, you know, money stopped being such a central feature of the economy and, and things were thought of in terms of exchanging labor and services and uh, agricultural goods and, and small handicraft goods and things like this. Uh, and I'll, I'll have more to say about that. There's more detail to the way that feudalism worked in some of my lectures on Marxism. Okay. Uh, okay, and now there is a contradiction here that maybe you picked up on already, is that the, endor the ordained priestly order, so these were priests, so they were clergy, um, the Templar Knights were clergy, and they're supposed to be prohibited from charging interest. But as we saw earlier, they're they're considered the first bankers, and um, and they were charging interest. Uh, okay, that's a contradiction. So the Pope is saying no charging of interest, but just ignoring the fact that the Knights Templar are out there charging interest. But of course, the Pope was very interested in continuing the Crusades, which are still ongoing at this point. Okay, so, um, and, and, and as I explained before, the Knights Templar were very essential to the whole crusading, especially getting all the way out to the Holy Land and getting back, you know, is just essential part of, of the whole thing. Um, okay, and then uh, Genghis Khan. All right, so uh, Genghis Khan then uh, comes on the scene a little bit later. So here's the Seljuk Empire, which you know caused trouble for the Caliphate, and then in this weakened position. The Crusaders come in and are, you know, doing their pilgrimage thing, and the Knights Templar are helping them out to take over lands in the in the Holy Land, and um, and then we have Saladin's Empire, which is a a, 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 a resurrection of the Caliphate, okay, but on a smaller scale. See, and then. Okay, and here is Genghis Khan. So the Mongol Empire, Genghis Khan and, and his marauders just traipse all the way across the world, all of uh, Eurasia, um, all the way into uh, uh, southern Russia, uh, into parts of Poland and some uh, Romania, uh, Czechoslovakia and just Eastern European is very much threatened. Eastern Europe is very much threatened by this. The Byzantine uh, remnant of the Roman Empire is, is very much threatened by this. This is their part, very much part of their territory, uh, harassed by them. So uh, this, uh, you know, the Mongols were held back in Eastern Europe but uh, nonetheless, it had a huge impact on European society. You had a lot of refugees just fleeing, flooding into uh, Western parts of Europe, uh, just getting out of the way. Um, because, you know, it took a few years, but it went really fast, but it was coming and people were heading out. And, um, and so, you know, this disrupted things quite a bit. 
as you can imagine. Um, and Thomas Aquinas, now Thomas Aquinas was the big theologian of, of uh, Roman Catholicism at this point. He consolidated all, all Roman Catholic doctrine uh, into a book called the Summa Theologica. And I have more to say about him um, in, in another video. Uh, but uh, I just want to highlight him here because he's a symbol of of the feudal order still existing, because he's uh, his thinking and his theology and philosophy is all tied into the feudal order. We see that feudalism is already breaking down because of this whole banking thing in particular. Uh, but Thomas Aquinas is very successful at making people feel like feudalism is still holding on and and you know reaching new heights. Um, intellectually, um, but the seeds of the demise of feudalism are already at play in the history and the historical reality. So thinking in terms of historical materialism, that's a concept from Marx um, that I will talk about elsewhere. Um, uh, the, from a perspective of historical materialism, we see that the seeds of the demise of of feudalism have already been planted. Thomas Aquinas is not aware of this. Okay, he's continuing, and the popes are not aware of this. Um, and one pope that's particularly emblematic of the breakdown of feudalism because of the hubris uh, that is demonstrated by the papacy is uh, Pope Boniface the Eighth. Uh, not long after. Aquinas in the next generation, um, he excommunicated King Philip of France, um, uh, largely for uh, uh, political reasons, and um, and he interfer interfered with Albert the First of Germany. Uh, Albert wanted to become the Holy Roman Emperor, and he was trying to set that up, and the Pope totally screwed up his plans. Uh, so the Pope's getting very involved in politics um, and trying to assert himself as uh, as a uh, as a king. Remember uh, that the Pope was the king of the Papal States in Central Italy, and you know controlled a fairly large kingdom of of you know smaller kingdoms. Uh, you know, so a kind of quasi empire in in the in the center of of Italy. He was an earthly king, and you know he's trying to throw his weight around. Uh, Boniface is here, and one indication that this didn't really jive with the way that people thought of the Pope is that um, in Dante's uh, Divine Comedy, where he depicts himself being led down. Uh, into hell by Virgil, um, and you know he describes the nine circles of hell. So there's only the ninth circle is the worst circle of hell, uh, and Boniface the eighth is in the eighth circle. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's some indication. And uh, Dante wrote this after the Pope was dead. Um, you know, 1320. Um, and the Boniface died in 1303, so you know about 20 years later, 15, 20 years later. But um, but his reputation was not a, a good reputation. Now, um, now the papacy, you know, Dante's. Um, Dante's vision and interpretation of Boniface VIII is very much informed by what happened in the subsequent uh, decades. Uh, so Pope Benedict the Eleventh, who took over from Boniface, uh, okay, so he reversed the excommunication of Philip, okay, and uh, he negotiated a, a truce between Philip and Edward I of England. 
Uh, and you know, cause, so that's very uh, important uh, because the Hundred Years War that will start uh, a couple of decades later, um, you know, it could have started, the Hundred Years War could have started earlier <laughs> in this time period, but the, the Pope is negotiating a peace and trying to, trying to keep order of things and using, okay, using the, the power of the papacy, uh, maybe in, in more legitimate and peaceful, uh, more peaceful manner and really paying attention to order, where Boniface seemed to not really <laughs> have that in mind. And then, uh, but then he died quickly after becoming Pope, and there is some suspicion that he was poisoned. Okay, so there's a lot of political intrigue going on here. And now the next Pope, Clement V, is taken into what is called the uh, Babylonian captivity, uh, an allusion to the Babylonian captivity of the Jews uh, in the that I, I, I spoke about before, um, but uh, officially called the Avignon Papacy. The, the seat of the papacy was moved from Rome, where all the papal states were, to Avignon, a city in France. So Philip IV controlled the papacy. That's why it's called a captivity um, by critics of this. Um, and they called it that at the time because this caused a big controversy to have the papacy moved, you know, and controlled by this this uh, king. Um, and, and we see uh, there's a map here, I think. You know, here's Avignon. This is France. This is modern day France, very similar to the way that it was in the day. Um, and then here's the border with Italy. This is Northern Italy, uh, and the Papal States are not even on the map. They're further down in Italy. So um, it was very much like a captivity. And Pope Clement then um, oversaw a trial of Boniface VIII for heresy. You know, and maybe this plays into uh, Dante's uh, depiction here is that he was put on trial for heresy, um, but he I, he wasn't convicted. Uh, you know, they didn't they weren't didn't find him actually guilty of heresy. You know, that would create a lot of problems for the for the papacy. <laughs> so I mean, it is even to put him on trial is an indication of the way that the papacy itself is delegitimizing the papacy. And, and that's just the feudal order eating itself. Um, so this is a, a very big sign of, of the breakdown of things. And then, okay, the Knights Templar are no longer ignored in their banking usury. Uh, the Knights Templar are disbanded and hunted down and, and eliminated. Uh, it just so happens that Philip owed them a bunch of money, was deeply in debt to them, and the interest was growing and growing, uh, as it tends to do. Um, so again, Philip orchestrates this whole thing, and we see the papacy now just being used as a tool of King Philip. Um, that was not the relationship between the papacy and kings uh, prior to this point. Uh, you know, Boniface VIII thought that he had a lot of power to really push Philip around. Okay, um, now, ecologically, there's a problem here. Uh, there is this, what's called the Little Ice Age, where uh, prior to this point, there had actually been a warm period in Europe. So temperatures were a little higher uh, in the preceding centuries, but around 1300, there was a dramatic shift so that there's a, a few degrees uh, on average, right? So just like global warming, you know, we're just talking about minor shifts in, in the temperature, uh, average temperature, but uh, things got colder. And that meant uh, longer winters and harsher winters, deeper winters, colder winters and reduced harvests. And um, by 1315, there's a great famine. 
So uh, this is uh, a, a, a very significant famine so that many people died. So, you know, we had um, in the preceding century uh, with Genghis Khan pushing people from the farther east into Western Europe, you know, you have this influx of population, then you have a little ice age, you have a great famine. And so you have, and, and in the preceding centuries, there was a warmer period. So harvests were actually larger than they had been historically before that. You have strong agriculture, you have uh, increasing population, uh, not only by the fact that people are being well fed, you know, when people are well fed, they have more kids uh, and the kids survive. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and then you also had influx of refugees and the population was exploding in this earlier period. But with the little ice age, you have this demographic collapse. You have the great famine is, and it was, uh, uh, short, but uh, a deep cut. Then we have the Hundred Years of War. And this is uh, split into three periods. There were truces here for short periods, you know, for eight or nine years, or, uh, you know, almost 40 years, okay. Um, but for a hundred years, England and France were at war, and it was, and it was. Uh, uh, if you're familiar with like Game Game of Thrones, and how there's all this maneuvering about who's going to take over uh, the kingdom and and uh, and and rule, you know, whatever their land is called, I can't remember. Um, that's the kind of thing that's going on here. There's these wars that are trying to determine who will control a combined England and France. Uh, so. Uh, and that went on for a hundred years. Very bloody. Um, a lot of people died. Uh, so this was in, it was significant for the population, um, significantly reduced the population in these areas. And <clears throat> armies from all over Europe were drawn into these, to this ongoing conflict. So it was, it was, something of a continental war, uh, but taking place within England and France, uh, the battles, but drawing in armies from all over Europe. Uh, and then just in the middle of the Hundred Years' War, uh, the Black Death, the Justinian's plague, uh, the bubonic plague uh, reemerges. So we have a second pandemic uh, of bubonic plague and it's very sharp and aggressive in the 14th century around 1350 and um and then it continues you know and, and you get some immunity and then it would come back and it just kept recurring for centuries uh but in in um just within the 14th century by the year 1400 or 1450 we had a demographic collapse in Europe where the population was reduced by half from what it was like in 1300 at the beginning of the Little Ice Age. So all these, that demographic collapse isn't purely about the plague. It is about the Little Ice Age, um, the Hundred Years War, and the plague. These are all working simultaneously, causing a huge drop in the population. Which, of course, and so this is important for our understanding of historical materialism and Marxism, is there's a labor shortage. And so feudalism has a big problem. If you are a feudal lord and you hold land, and the way that you use the land to enhance your wealth is by working the serfs to produce agricultural products and et cetera for you. When there's fewer serfs, the whole thing starts to fall apart. Uh, now you have open tracts of land that maybe aren't being cultivated 
and and this begins to cause economic problems for you. You got to scramble and figure out something else. But the only model you have is feudalism. Okay, so so that's that's a real kicker. A labor shortage in a feudal system where you know your serfs, half of your serfs died within a number of decades. Uh, for the Lord uh, who inherits this land tenure, they're just spinning their wheels. How are we going to make this work? We're, we're not as wealthy as we used to be. What, what are we going to do? Uh, it's a crisis. All right. Um, so then uh, we have... We have the end of the Babylonian captivity uh, of the Avignon papacy, but then you have the papal schism, where then there ends up being two popes. So the 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 Avignon papacy, uh, you know, then there becomes contenders where you know there's there's two popes, one in in Avignon and one in and, and one in in Rome, and now the whole papacy is looking like a joke. Uh, like who you, who is the pope? Like that's that's literally the question of the day: is who is the pope? Which pope is really pope? And, and of course, there were factions, and people, you know, just getting crazy uh, about this political situation. You know, like like the like the QAnon type. Uh, conspiracy theories, uh, where you know one pope is the antichrist, but it depends on which which side of the debate you're on. Who is the antichrist? But one pope is the real pope, and one pope is the fake pope, the antichrist of the apocalypse, uh, and the end of the world is coming. And of course, the plague is going on. Half the population has has died or is about to die, and you know in the process of dying. And there's two popes and it's crazy. The feudal order is, there's no order. There's no coherency. Everything has just gone all pear-shaped, let's say. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, uh, and, and then in this time is when the Renaissance begins. So Petrarch is seen as the godfather of the Renaissance. And he was a Latin scholar, um, you know, uh, well-versed in languages, uh, in Latin and Greek, which are the big two languages, but also began to look into Hebrew and begin to think about how do we educate scholars to really become linguistic experts. And he wrote a lot of, um, uh, eloquent sort of writing, so he, he heightened the style of writing and just had an overall great aesthetic that was very inspiring to a lot of people. And um, But his work on languages is what is seems to be most important because then you have people like John Wycliffe who was a, um, was, uh, was he in Canterbury? Uh, he was a priest and seminary professor at Oxford University. Okay, so at Oxford, um, which still exists today, um, he's working there and uh, and he is retranslating the Bible. And, and so we have the Latin Vulgate um, that was translated by Jerome into Latin back in the fourth century century when Christianity became the official religion of, of the Roman Empire. But Wycliffe is retranslating the Bible with fresh eyes. And he uh, and he's translated into Middle English. Okay. Um, And now it indicates here that he's actually looking at the Vulgate, but I believe he was also looking at the Greek. Um, 
uh, but he makes what is called the Woodcliffe Bible, um, which is somewhat influential, but more influential is his ideas that as he begins to retranslate the Bible into English, he begins to get some variant theological ideas and begins to teach those at Oxford. Um, and he becomes one of the key inspirations for the Reformation, the rebellion of a certain class of Catholics who found the, the Roman Catholic Church to be totally corrupt and split off. Uh, they originally wanted to reform, that's what Reformation, you know, they're like, we're going to reform the church, but ultimately they just split off. It's like today, uh, Black Lives Matter talking about reforming the police. Um, is that really going to happen? That it's going to be a peaceful, nice reformation? It doesn't look like it. You know, Democrats are starting to uh, form a backlash movement against Black Lives Matter and say, shut up, sit down. We're not going to reform the police. You guys are making us lose elections. Um, and, and we don't care about Black Lives Matter. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're going to say things that make people not vote for us. Um, and, you know, similar thing, like people start talking about reforming the church, it all starts to, you know, get very um, fractious, you know. So um, Wycliffe is one of these seeds of the Reformation. And of course, the Reformation is like the death knell of feudalism. Okay, and one thing, um, that leads up to the Reformation as well is the popular rebellions. So these are uh, populist sort of uprisings, like, like Black Lives Matter, where it's not highly organized and happening in lots of different places, uh, but it's kind of a movement. And uh, this is happening all over Europe, you know, for, uh, for an extended uh, time period here. So we have uh, Flemish revolts uh, in, in the Netherlands and St. George's Night Uprising in Estonia, out in Eastern Europe, you know, France, England, the Peasants' Revolt. I mean, in England, they just call this the Peasants' Revolt. And you know that they're talking about 1381 because it was a huge uh, uprising. Um, and, and of course, oh, and, and these are called Peasant Revolts. Okay, really what we're still, I mean, officially feudalism still exists. And, you know, the literature talks about peasant revolts, but it's the revolt of the serfs, that the serfs are organizing, self-organizing and rising up. And of course, the serfs are heavily exploited. They don't have a lot of resources, uh, but they are so fed up with the feudal order that they're like, F it, we're, we're, this is an uprising. This is it. We can't take it anymore. Um, uh, and, and these rural peasant revolts are happening out in the countryside, not in the cities. Okay, we have Sweden, um, uh, Galatia, Transylvania, England, another rebellion, um, in Catalonia, in, uh, in Spain. So this is once the Spanish Empire is in full swing, um, et cetera, et cetera. You have urban revolts, so these are things happening in towns and cities, uh, in Greece, Italy, Florence, uh, so Rome is in Italy, Florence is in Italy. Uh, uh, the Maotine uh, revolt is in, is in Leon, the, the second largest city in Paris, but then moves to Paris uh, and is a huge uh, very violent. Uh, this, they're called the Mayotines because they used hammers and they used hammers to like smash in the heads of bankers uh, on the street. The bankers, you now bankers would normally set up a table at the marketplace. Like you think of like a farmer's market, lots of things being sold, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and then the bankers would have a table there and that's where they would conduct their business just out on the street. Uh, the Mayotines took these wooden hammers and were smashing people's heads in. Um, that you know, whoever the mob mentality thought was the appropriate victim. Um, 
Now, part of this phenomenon is the Hussite rebellion in Czechoslovakia. And Jean Hus uh, is uh, a big, so he's one of these precursors like John Wycliffe uh, of the Reformation, where he had divergent the theological ideas. He was a priest um, and he was engaged in, in like teaching lay people the doctrine of the church. And as he got into teaching lay people, then they began to ask questions, like honest questions, you know, the, you know, priests who grew up learning to become priests often don't ask simple, naive questions. Uh, his, his parishioners uh, that he was trying to inform with theological thinking started to ask him questions, hard questions. And um, in response to that, he starts to have divergent theology, and uh, and he's very influenced by John Wycliffe. So he reads John Wycliffe, and even just adopts some some of his um, talking points verbatim. Um, <clears throat> so so he's very influenced by John Wycliffe, um, and. Uh, one of the things that he was very much against was indulgences. So this was a practice where if you'd committed a serious sin, you could purchase an indulgence for a small sum of money. And, and here we see again, the role of money is people are, are paying money for indulgences, which means that on pay, they would give you like a, a scroll an official document from the Pope um, <clears throat> that would say that your sins are forgiven. So it's like, um, it's like uh, more than going to confession. It's more like, a, you know, makes people feel more satisfied in their forgiveness of sins. Um, very official, right? You got it written down on paper, I'm forgiven. Um, but one of the controversies is that people, you know, as people are wont to do, they'll try to work the system in some weird way. Uh, you know, what people were doing was even buying indulgences for sins they hadn't committed yet. <clears throat> and, um, you know, and, and this was well known and Obviously, that's not legitimate, um, but but it was a practice, and it was a way of the church making money. So again, the, the papacy is involved in this whole money economy. But feudalism is is essentially over, right? Uh, once the pope is trying to make money, um, and and you know, part of it is to fund the crusades. And um, and and Jean Hus was very critical of both of these practices, the the indulgences and the crusades, the whole concept of crusade. Um, and then um, you know he publicly uh, attacked the church in fourteen eleven and fourteen fifteen. He's executed by the pope. Okay. So, um, you know, and here we have the beginnings of the, you know, the early phase of the Inquisition, if you're familiar with that. Okay, and then, uh, and then what the Pope does is, is authorize a crusade or several crusades against the Hussites, the people back in Czechoslovakia that, um, are inspired by Hussite's teaching, which, you know, are um, very similar to what will become the Reformation, which was very inspiring to a lot of people and, and had a liberatory sort of message uh, for serfs, especially, <clears throat> you know, as the feudal order is breaking down, and so there's lots of people in Czechoslovakia that are devotedly committed to uh, Hus's teachings. They're called the Hussites, and um, 
they're taking over towns and throwing out the mayors. Um, and, um, you know, uh, literally throwing mayors out of windows, <laughs> um, a, you know, second story windows. Um, and, um, and so the Pope authorizes crusades against them. And you have all these armies from Germany and, and France and, um, you know, smaller kingdoms that are launching wars against the Hussites and they're unsuccessful. So again, this is a breakdown of, of feudalism because the Crusades were largely successful. Those first nine, you know, big Crusades out to the Holy Land were relatively successful. Um, the Hussites fight off the Crusaders. And notice that this is a crusade against Christians. Okay, they're heretical Christians, according to the Pope, but nonetheless, they claim to be true Christians. And then you're, 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 as a crusader, you're going to war against people who the only the only crime uh, that they've committed is to be overly devoted to their form of Christianity. Um, there's some kind, you know, some difficulty there intellectually. Um, now, the Hussites engaged in unconventional warfare, so. Um, uh, a kind of guerrilla warfare where you have these armies that are used to conducting warfare in a certain way. You have knights that are wearing armor, they're mounted on horse, and they have lances, and they're, and they're doing cavalry maneuvers, and the Hussites have guns. So they have hand cannons, early guns, and they're, they're circling the wagons and making mobile forts so that they can just, uh, out in, uh, out of can make little formations of forts, uh, little formations of wagons uh, get inside there that protects them from the cavalry maneuvers and they're shooting uh, primitive guns uh, while these guys are riding on horse, uh, you know, trying to slay them with their lance. Um, <clears throat> so it's like uh, bringing a knife to a gunfight. Um, Okay, so so that's kind of that's kind of interesting, and kind of interesting to think about uh, guerrilla warfare, like with uh, Che Guevara and Fidel Castro in Cuba, uh, in Latin America, which we'll we'll be um, we'll be thinking about later. Um, okay, so uh, the House of Medici. So the House of Medici was a, a family an Italian family based in Florence, and they came to prominence in Florence through banking. These are the biggest bankers in Italy and the biggest, biggest, eventually they become the biggest bankers in all of Europe. They are the bank. When you, when you think of bank, you think of Medici. Um, during this Renaissance uh, demise of feudalism. And uh, and, and lots of uh, nobles uh, are part of the family. So as they, as, and, and so this is also uh, something, well, these are kind of typical of the burger movement. The, the townspeople become more important than the landed nobility. So you have a family of bankers who live in a city and don't own large tracts of land. They're not feudal lords, but they, accumulate so much money wealth that they become more powerful than most of the landed lords and nobles. Uh, that is a big problem for feudalism. Okay. Um, and, and then members of the family get married off and become landed nobles. So they start to uh, not only just have money wealth, but actually then become part of the aristocracy. But their, but their origins are obviously just based in money, not in some God-given right to land through the king, but just somebody who practiced usury. Uh, and they were not Jews. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> 
So they're doing something that was officially illegal and become the most powerful people in the entire society. Okay. Um, now, just about this time is when movable type became, so you have the, the modern printing press. It was a huge technological revolution. Before uh, the time of movable type, and uh, Gutenberg, uh, I don't think that he actually invented it. I mean, who knows who invented it, but he certainly made, he, he made a, a big impact, especially by publishing the Bible. So he published the Latin Vulgate um, in Latin, but in printed version. The Vulgate had always been hand copied before this time. And all books were hand copied. And then in the middle of the 15th century, the printing press comes along and you can churn out copies of books like never before. And this is a huge, uh, it's like the internet revolution. It might be bigger than the revolution of the internet. This is more significant uh, probably than the, the beginning of the internet. Uh, yeah, the way, when I was a when I was a kid, the internet came along, and that was uh, you know a big transformation. Of course, we were very excited about it and thought about the cultural shift. Was about, and often we compared it to the printing press, but thought you know it's going to be bigger than the printing press because it's worldwide. But it's hard to it's hard to uh, overestimate the impact that the printing press uh, made on world history. So you have the Bible getting into the hands of people that never would even be able to touch a Bible, right? You know, the, the, your, your local cathedral, uh, the cathedral in your parish, they, ha they had a copy of the Vulgate, uh, and sometimes the priest would read out of it during a sermon but you didn't get to touch it. You didn't get to read it, um, and you didn't necessarily. You didn't even know how to read Latin, um, for the most part. Uh, but now, people can buy a Bible, and they can teach. They can have tutors come in if they have money. Uh, they can they can hire tutors and have their children taught to read, uh, you know, classical Latin, and uh, and they can read the Bible for themselves come up with their own interpretations. All right, so there's a big seed of the Reformation. Uh, and one thing that Cosimo Medici, who was like the biggest Medici of all time, he really made the name of the Medici family, uh, the richest man in the world, you know, like this is like Jeff Bezos of the time. Um, and of course we have just Be Jeff Bezos taking joy rides into low earth orbit, okay. Um, but uh, Cosimo, like one of, one of the things he does is to uh, make a public library in Florence and then uh, commission that the complete works of Plato um, be compiled and then printed on the printing press. Uh, and he just paid for it up front and just made it happen. And so now people are not only reading the Bible for themselves, uh, John Wycliffe has translated in into English. Other people are translating it into uh, Italian and Spanish and, and French. And people are really being able to read the Bible and they're being able to read uh, Plato. And, and of course, uh, Plato was not, uh, uh, the reason why I mentioned it here, and I'll talk about this in another lecture is that during the medieval order at the time of Thomas Aquinas, uh, Aristotle was the philosopher and most intellectuals did not really consider Plato uh, that much after the time of Thomas. Before that, Plato played a role, but it was a confused, uh, vague understanding of Plato. But with this printing, Plato becomes part of the center of the conversation, especially amongst philosophers. And this is important for us because of philosophy class. Okay, it's important for me. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and, um, okay, so that's a big intellectual, like bomb, the printing press. 
huge. Um, now, at the same time, these there's these later crusades out to the Holy Land, kind of, but really the Ottoman, uh, the Ottoman Empire is now uh, standing in the way of getting to. So here's the Byzantine Empire. We looked at this a little bit. Um, so we went through this part earlier. And so here, we keep going. And here's the Crusader Kingdoms, the Sassanid uh, Empire, or Saladin's Empire, sorry. Genghis Khan, okay, so this is still medieval, feudal order is still intact. But in the wake of, of uh, Genghis Khan, now the Ottoman Empire um, emerges. Uh, and, and this is a caliphate. So this is a reemergence of the caliphate uh, uh, again. And it's very extensive. The so-called Holy Land, Palestine, is fully under control. Uh, and notice that the Ottoman Empire has now taken over Greece, Romania, you know, uh, uh, into uh, modern-day Kosovo, and and where uh, it's working its way into Europe. Um, what would previously have been considered Europe, and uh, and so uh, feudal European kingdoms are falling to the Ottomans, and they're marching westward uh, progressively. Now, part of this is is that uh, is that the the Pope is issuing uh, uh, pronouncements you know, and saying, okay, you, I need you to go to crusade against the Ottomans uh, over and over again. And um, the crusades are failing. They can't beat the Ottomans. The Ottomans are fighting them off and, and, and acquiring new territory all the while. Um, and so they go into Gallipoli, um, Bulgaria, the Serbian Empire falls to the Ottomans. Um, and then they not only they not only take over smaller kingdoms, but they eliminate the last remnants of the Roman Empire. This is when the Roman Empire finally falls. So the decline of Rome has been happening during this entire historical period that I've discussed in this lecture and the previous lecture on the fall of Rome and the rise of feudalism. So Rome is falling apart. Feudalism is rising. Feudalism is already falling apart. And the Roman Empire, there's still a small remnant of the Roman Empire hanging on. The emperor of Rome sitting in Constantinople as the empire is just shrinking and shrinking. And, um, and then finally, the Ottomans uh, take Constantinople in, in 1453. So that's a big blow. And then there's just one smaller area um, uh, uh, the Peloponnese of Greece which is um, kind of a, a, a peninsula but it's a larger landmass but it kind of uh, kind of has the features of a peninsula uh, we can look here so right here this area uh, I don't think you can see this on, on here but let me do this. That's probably good. Find a map here. So let me make sure you're seeing this. Yeah, okay. So the Peloponnesus is this landmass right here. It's surrounded mostly by water. There's just this isthmus where Corinth is located. 
that connects it to the larger landmass. The last remnants of the Roman Empire are, are uh, a couple of small kingdoms that are based in the Peloponnese. And the Ottomans eventually take that, and, and that's, that's all she wrote for the Roman Empire. In 1460, you know, we think about the Roman Empire as being back later in time, but the Roman Empire survived all the way up to that point. Um, you know, and, and before the Ottomans came on the scene, uh, the, the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, was fairly stable. So it's really the Ottomans that, you know, and, and then, of course, Genghis Khan is a big part of that. So Genghis Khan caused trouble for the Byzantine Empire, began to put pressure as, as the Mongols uh, fade away and return back to Mongolia and China. Um, has a big impact on China as well. Um, then, uh, then the Ottomans are able to resurrect the, the caliphate and very successfully for a very long time. The Ottoman Empire will last until 1922, uh, at the end of World War I. So one of the key, one of the biggest adversaries of the United States and England during the war, during World War I was the Ottoman Empire. That was, the big, if you've ever heard of Lawrence of Arabia, uh, Lawrence of Arabia was fighting against the Ottomans uh, uh, in the Ottoman Empire. Okay, so, and, and, and of course, uh, they take over all of Greece eventually, and, uh, and they're well into Europe, okay. And let's see. Okay, so then we have Erasmus. Um, so this is certainly, now we're into the, the Renaissance. Feudalism is over. Um, and uh, Erasmus is a big symbol of humanism. So when we speak of humanism, Erasmus is like the godfather of human. Uh, uh, Petrarch that I mentioned earlier, He's also considered the godfather of humanism, uh, but Erasmus was uh, maybe uh, more, well, more influential for one thing because the printing press existed. Um, so Erasmus popularized the ideas, you know, to the extent that intellectual ideas are popular, okay. But, um, but among intellectuals, he was able to popularize the ideas of Plutarch and, and, and Petrarch and other uh, people like that, um, <clears throat> and he was a Catholic theologian and remained faithful to the Roman Catholic Church, so he wasn't part of the Reformation, but he was just as disruptive uh, in, in an intellectual way. He, he remained Catholic and remained committed to Catholic, Catholic doctrine, but he was very critical of the Church. And um, uh, his big work that was highly influential was the book In Praise of Folly. And um, published, you know, in, in printed form from the printing press in 1511. Um, and so it's a satirical attack on superstitions, other traditions of European society, and on the Western church. Um, okay. And so, it's satirical, and so it's you know tongue in cheek, and you know not necessarily be be uh, supposed to be taken literally. And, it, and there's lots of metaphors, like a ship of fools. Um, we have this. Well, it used to be more popular, but there's a saying: "Oh, it's a ship of fools." It's just like a bunch of people um, being ridiculous. Uh, that's out of this work. You know, he really has this metaphor of a people, you know, 
in a ship and they're all uh, spouting off strange ideas and a lot of these are Roman Catholic ideas or things about feudalism and, and it's like it's ridiculous because feudalism is not operating anymore. It's like people are holding on to a past that doesn't exist. Um, and then he also, uh, now this is very big, it does lay the groundwork for the Reformation and um, you know, but nonetheless, he officially was like, I'm not part of the Ref Reformation. Okay. Um, but he made a, and, and the Reformation, he was kind of old by the time the Reformation took off. So he you know, was like, I'm not going to get involved in this. Um, but he had, before the Reformation, because the Reformation doesn't happen until 1530s with Martin Luther. Um, but he, translated the New Testament of the Bible into Latin, fresh, brand new, um, a full, you know, retranslation um, without reference to the Latin Vulgate and trying to be really scholarly accurate about the Greek and translating it into Latin so that this would replace uh, the, at least the New Testament of the Latin Vulgate. And of course, there are similar projects going on to do the whole Bible, um, especially uh, one in Spain that eventually was published after um, Erasmus published his uh, New Testament. And uh, so he, he translated it into Latin, and Latin's like the official language of scholars still. So if you were in a university, you would write your papers in Latin. It didn't, didn't matter what, nobody spoke Latin, but that's the what you would write in. Okay, um, and so he translates it into Latin so that everybody, all the scholars in Europe can read it. And, uh, and it's printed on the printing press. And not only does he print the Latin, but he also prints the Greek. So you can look, so for the first time people and, and the complete works of Plato uh, that was published by uh, Cosimo uh, Medici, um, that was written in Greek. So people were starting to, and, and if you're reading Plato in Greek, you know, this is good Greek. Uh, uh, and you actually, you actually learn um, good Greek. Uh, the New Testament is written in Koine Greek, which is a little more um, loose, you know, not as formal. Uh, but if you could read Plato, you could read the New Testament in Greek easily. And it's easier to read, like that's how you learn to read Greek, is you read Greek, New Testament Greek, because it's simple. And, um, and so now people have printed versions of the New Testament, even able to, to start to, you know, learn how to read the Greek and there's, you know, there's no translation. You can translate it into your own language yourself. Um, okay, that's key to the Reformation, because then people start to translate the Bible themselves, and as slight changes in words and putting it in your own language makes it very different. Your natural language, not Latin, and and. Uh, the Reformation is, is about to happen. Okay, and, and then um, finally, okay, coming to a conclusion here. I know this has been a long one. Um, you should feel free, of course, when you're watching these videos, just break it up. You also can use the speed control, so you can speed it up, right, if that works for you, and you can still understand what's going on. Um, <clears throat> but there is um, another key work that shows the demise of feudalism. And this is written by Niccolo uh, Machiavelli. He wrote a book called The Prince. And it, ostensibly, it's advice to a young prince. So Machiavelli is like acting like a tutor to a young prince who's going to take over a kingdom. Uh, but his advice is just to be ruthless, to disregard all morality. And have no notions of chivalry, of moral compunction, of religious attitude, 
a purely cynical, ruthless uh, approach. And, and, you know, and it does seem that he's really writing it for a, like a young prince of the Medici family, uh, you know, who's not necessarily like a, a nobleman, but, but somebody who has money wealth and is using money wealth uh, in a princely fashion. Okay, and, and so it's, it's, um, it's uh, quite a, a difference from the way that any sort of advice to a feudal uh, prince uh, would be construed. It's, it's just an entirely different world. Um, and so, you know, that just shows how far, uh, and, and he wrote, uh, he was writing in, I was, believe he's from Florence, uh, but, and, and he is uh, connected to these moneyed well families. Um, but, you know, he's from the perspective of, of Italy, where this town based nouveau riche, uh, the bourgeoisie, have developed and his attitudes are very bourgeois. And, and I'll explain more uh, in another video what, what I mean by bourgeois. Okay, uh, but that's a big key term, uh, you know, thrown around amongst Marxists and, and people outside of Marxism, you know, like we even say like, oh, it's so bougie. That means it's so bourgeois. Okay. Um, <clears throat> All right, so that is that. Um, okay, so that's the end of the video. And I will see you later. Bye-bye.